family an important one, um, especially for those of you familiar with much of the climate we're currently living in. Joining me uh, on the stage today is one of our returning champions, Sister Marianne Hepper, Sister St. Joseph of Orange, uh, a spiritual director, educator, and associate director of the CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice. Welcome, Sister. And our newest contender, uh, Professor Kai Henderson, clinical associate professor of journalism here at LMU, uh, and the former Los Angeles Bureau Chief of Vice News, if I understand correctly. So Kai, thank you for being with us. Thank you. So, my first question tonight, Kyle, I'll throw to you. Without kind of giving away too much of what we might see tonight, although I imagine some people can, can imagine having seen the trailer, as a journalist yourself, how do you find the life, day in the life of these journalists uh, that they experience, how, how uh, truthful do you find that um, in the sense that is it unique to their location or is it more of kind of a state on the whole of journalism at the moment? That's a good question. I think it's definitely a statement on the whole of journalism. Uh, I don't want to say too much per se about uh, Brazil and Mexico just because I don't live there, I don't, I'm not as familiar. Um, but in terms of their day to day, um, some of them, it's very, it's not like most journalists because some of those journalists are awesome and they're literally risking their lives. Uh, most journalists don't do that, to be honest, and they're truly uh, acting as watchdogs uh, against the powerful uh, and corrupt. And uh, that's, I would say, the most important role journalists play. But um, not all journalists play that role. Uh, there are many, many jobs in journalism, and the vast majority of them are not uh, going out and doing what these four journalists are doing. Do you find this, th this conversation right now that we're having, and what this documentary covers in terms of the state of journalists as being their, their livelihood and their life, and perhaps even the, the profession itself being threatened, is this something new? Has this been going on for history? Because I know there's a tendency sometimes to romanticize, you know, the journalism of the past here uh, in the U.S. So uh, for a lot of us, it feels like this is a new phenomenon. But is it truly a new phenomenon? Or are we just only hearing about it now? It's not a new phenomenon. I think, uh, again, speaking just of the U.S., I think the degree that public figures feel comfortable uh, demonizing journalists and even calling for their physical harm, that's certainly something we haven't seen in a, at least in a long time. But I mean, uh, James Adams, the uh, second president of the United States, uh, basically passed a sedition law that made it illegal for journalists to say anything bad about him. Uh, and they could be thrown in jail or deported. So it, it started very early on that people in power were sick of journalists holding them to account. Old habits die hard, it seems. So let me ask you this, if I may. In light of what we know now, too, especially for those of us in the, in the you know, that are uh, outside the profession, looking in, why go into this profession? What, what, what calls people into this profession, if I may? So perhaps for you specifically, if you feel comfortable speaking to your own personal experience, what, what calls you into the profession of journalism? Um, why go into this profession is exactly the question my mother asked me when I said I might major in it. Um, did I see James Adams earlier? John Adams. Um, to be, so to be honest, myself, when I was in high school, I wanted to major in creative writing or something along those lines. But um, again, mother wasn't thrilled about that, so uh, journalism sounded more like a job than creative writer um, or journalist. Um, you know, but it became something I really enjoyed. And uh, I, I really, when I was younger, I just wanted to kind of move to New York, uh, work for magazines, have fun, do more consumer magazine-oriented general interest stuff. Uh, and that's what I did, and it was great. And I got, as I got older, I started to really want to do some more serious uh, stuff. And that's when, I mean, it was really just like the next, I thought, man, I got to change. And, like the next day Vice News call that was really serendipitous. Um, and 
when I left Vice News in 2017, I was really burned out, really jaded about the journalism business. Uh, and I use the word business intentionally, because um, it's really driven by business, by money, uh, in all these different ways now. Um, uh, but I, you know, it sounds corny, but I gotta say, I, I started teaching here as an adjunct long after that, and have stayed uh, since. And uh, while I worry about journalism writ large and um, the ability of journalism and journalists to figure out how to make good journalism a business, especially local journalism, um, I don't have faith in that. But I have faith in the students I get to work with. And uh, I, I trust that they're going to go out and, and figure it out, figure out how to keep this going. And I always tell my classes, figure out how to make journalism a business and you'll be rich and famous. Uh, so fingers crossed one of them will do that. What do you think the future might hold, thinking of your students, for journalism? Do you think we'll kind of um, move away from the, 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 the ratings and the money that's kind of influenced much of journalism today? Or is that going to continue perhaps in a different way? Right now, it seems like the two business modes that uh, work are nonprofit journalism, which is really interesting, really exciting. Uh, it's not new, but um, it, it's becoming more common. Uh, ProPublica is an amazing uh, outlet that uh, I think is probably the, the vanguard of that model. Um, and the other model is having a rich person own you, uh, who maybe isn't super concerned about losing money. Um, although, eventually they become concerned about losing money, uh, as Jeff Bezos recently uh, did about the Washington Post, but, um, you know, um, it used to be that journalism or owning a newspaper or whatever was considered sort of like a civic duty, like uh, uh, people who had made a lot of money in other industries, they wanted to own a paper so they could say they were helping, uh, you know, that fourth estate uh, survive and, and helping truth come out and keep making sure that the powerful weren't abusing the less powerful and all that stuff. But uh, that was when a newspaper could mint money. Uh, and now it's kind of the opposite, especially local news. Um, and so there aren't that many rich people who are stepping in to kind of do a, a, a civic service almost. Um, so short answer, I have no idea uh, how, how it's going to be corrected or saved or whatever you want to say. We're all in similar boats coming out of this pandemic and a multitude of our professions. I want to unpack something a bit more that you just brought up, if I may. This idea of duty. Perhaps that's one of a toolbox of things. Um, I'm curious as to, given the difficulties certainly of, of the business of journalism, the actual journalism itself, which we'll see in the film, uh, where journalists are much more under assault day, you know, day by day, whether uh, in small ways or even having their life threatened, or the, the lives of their loved ones threatened. Uh, is there something in, a to in, in this toolbox that it perhaps includes the idea of duty that you and your colleagues pull from to sustain you uh, through all these hardships? Because clearly we're not running, you know, I don't see necessarily all the journalists hanging up their coats and, and, and notebooks. They're still clearly out in the field doing the work. What sustains them? What, what keeps them going amid all these other reasons that other people might go, oh, I'm out. That's a great question. I mean, there are, I mean, the nation's PR and marketing departments are littered with former journalists. I mean, a lot of people are either voluntarily leaving or being forced out because uh, there are fewer and fewer jobs. I think there are something like 25%, I think this is in the movie actually, 25% fewer journalists than there were, you know, 20 years ago, something along those lines. Um, you know, I think, I think any good journalist has within them rage, uh, has something has that anger to tap into, to get angry at injustice. Um, uh, and that's, I think that drives a lot of people. I think the people in the movie seem to all have that to one degree or another, to have that pain them to see people
people taken advantage of uh, or, or whatever it was and them want to tell the world this is happening and it should stop. Thank you, Kai. I really appreciate that, that honest assessment. And that brings me to something I'd like to ask you, sister. Because I think, again, we're getting into this idea of a sustainment in hard times. There's much uh, that the human experience has to say about that, both in, in a psychological level, a spiritual level. Someone who yourself who's in spiritual direction and teaches in that field, where do you see exercises for sustainability, resistance, uh, perhaps made available or understood um, in, in our own, you know, in the Catholic tradition, a number of traditions that helps to sustain people, whatever activity they're doing, through hardships? Well, I think for one, understanding, I think where that drive comes from in the first place is very helpful. I think there's a deep passion in people who are mission-driven towards something that they feel is worth striving for and also, as you indicated, even maybe worth laying life down for. And so I think what sustains people uh, in, in doing that is knowing that there are others who are, they are in union with who are also doing that. I think there's a kind of interconnectedness with folks driven to that, with that kind of passion to share the truth. And I think the other thing um, that's also very true is that people who I believe who want to speak about the truth in society in that particular way and take those kind of risks, realize the value of the human story and the human person behind that story. And I think that the fact that we're interconnected human beings and relationship is primary, that desire to share the difficulties or to share the hardships or even to share the good story is part of that drive towards truth and also interconnectedness and to help um, be part of weaving that fabric uh, and that web of interconnectedness. Um, what would sustain them, I think, is, uh, I think I'd go back to others doing the same and also the response that people get when they see the truth making an impact or making a difference or changing a possibility. And so I think that's, that to me is, is part of, of, the, of what sustains. This idea of the drive to understand the truth, and, and Kyle, along the same lines of what you mentioned, this rage in the face of injustice. What do you, what do you think that says about us as humans? Why, why, why do we rage in the face of injustice? Why do, we, why do we desire to seek the truth? What is it innately in us, regardless of our background, our, our, our spiritual beliefs, um, our, our philosophical thinking? It's almost instinctual, it seems. Well, I think, I think the rage comes because we know that injustice and um, untruth uh, cannot sustain a society or a relational set of existences. Uh, and we're relational beings. And I, I think at, at our core we strive to survive. So I think it's, I, from my perspective, I think it's an act and a, and, and a desire for survival, not just for myself, but for, the, for our human community, uh, for civilization. I mean, if you're going to get really grandiose about it. We've got plenty of time to get grandiose. <laughs> and, and also my neighbor next door. And the community who I'm serving by telling this story. So I think it, it, it's at the core of who we are. We're relational beings. Um, you know, if we have a religious perspective, we see the other as a very creative um, gift from the divine. Uh, even if we don't have that, we see another human being's worth in terms of, of who they are and, and what they're about and that they're important enough to 
strive for, to rage against an injustice for. So I think there's something in us that brings us to that point, provided we find that of value. Kai, is that your experience? Does that sound like a similar experience for yourself and, and journalists in the field? That just that desire? I think everybody has it, whether you're a journalist or not. You have that, uh, I think you use the word instinctual uh, desire to know what is going on around you uh, or what's going on over the next hill, right? Uh, even if it's not in your immediate vicinity, you know, I think it's just programmed into us because. Many years ago, was there a saber-toothed tiger over there? But and now it's very different. Um, but we still we still have that. And I think you know there are so many. I think the movie talks about this. There are so many news deserts in the U.S. Places where there is very little or no local news uh, coverage. And uh, you know that basically does two things. Uh, one, it, it allows local officials to uh, again abuse their power to become corrupt because there's no one there to watch over them, uh, which in turn makes people living there uh, dislike and resent government. Uh, and the second thing it does is, uh, I think, make people scared um, because they don't know what's going on around them. They don't know how to tell how to know. Uh, and there are many, many people uh, in the US, uh, many, many politicians who are all too eager to step in and say, I got you, I'll tell you what's going on. Only I know. You have to listen to me if you want to know what's going on. Everyone else is lying. So follow me and I will tell you. Uh, and, you know, you see a lot of that. And I think it's not an accident uh, that, I've never looked at maps, but I would guess if you maybe looked at certain Electoral maps and news de desert maps. I'll bet there'd be a lot of overlap, is my guess. In that void of information, you know, and, and, and thinking of this, you know, desire or instinctual desire to, to seek truth and information, is that where misinformation begins to flourish? I think. Short answer is, is yes. Uh, again, if people feel they don't have answers they need, they go searching. Uh, and then if uh, someone says, oh, I, I know how you feel, you, you can only listen to me. If people get roped into that, then yeah, those, they, those people can tell them whatever they want to tell them. Uh, and the people will believe it because they want to believe something. And if they're told time and time again that they can't believe anything else, well, they're going to believe something. Um, because they have, people just have to. Um, so I think that's definitely a, a big factor. I mean, and there are practical reasons, of course, uh, social media, the internet, etc. Um, uh, but yes, I think you're right. And I certainly agree with your assessment, too, about the need to believe something. And sister, is that something that's something humans need to? Is that another thing, the need to believe in, in whatever that belief might be, the desire to believe in something that's other than themselves? I, I would say so, I, and it, that of course comes in many forms. I think people have a desire to, to um, and I think they have a sense of it. I think it's something that, um, that they realize there's something larger than themselves by looking around at what exists and what's come before them and what's possibly going to come after them. I think that, that there's a seed of curiosity. And I think that that curiosity uh, can take many sh shapes and forms that it can, you know, the fruit of it can be much, you know, varied. But I think at, at many people at their core is this curiosity about what is, what is more, what's possible, um, what is really sustaining me. And I think people have touchstones in their experience in the natural world as well as in relationships of something that's um, they, that they know moves them that's beyond their own imagination or their own psyche. And I, I think there is something uh, to that. And of course I, I have a belief in that because of my own uh, belief that that whole inner spirit 
and that creative reality that formed me is in me. So I, I have that you know, archetype in my own experience. However, I think it, it is found in, in, in individuals in different ways and different expressions. When we talk about these types of things like spirituality, is it innately tied to justice? Can we separate those two? Because right now it sounds like we're talking, it really seems that they are so innately intertwined that in some respects you can't separate. Yeah, I would certainly say that would be true for for my own uh, the roots of my own religious congregation, which at part of their core are uh, Ignatian. You know, the, Ignatius talks about being a contemplative in action. And what are you acting about? You're acting for the health, the well-being, and we say the dear neighbor without dis distinction. A very French phrase. But it's about everyone, serving, serving everyone you see, regardless of who they are or what they're about, in order to better or to help or to assist or in the religious language to do the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, you know, feed the hungry and so forth, you know, visit the imprisoned, all those kinds of things. And what's the point of it to sometimes right or wrong to secure right relationships, to help provide for people for what they justly deserve. And so I would say the two things are very, very closely aligned. And you can't have one without the other, I don't think. And so if we take a look at being a contemplative in action, you have that spiritual connection, but the spiritual connection doesn't mean a whole lot unless it moves out to really serve the other. I'm just curious, are you, sir, you can't have one without the other. Are you saying that you can't have either without the other? You can't have justice without spiritual belief? I think what you can have without the other, if you have a spiritual core, there's something I think that drives a person to justice. It might not be in the religious sense or using spiritual language. But there's a, there's a sense of mutual relationship, kindredness, kindred spirit with another. I think that can be the driving force as well. Maybe that's the way someone would translate it. I can't see another in distress like this. I can't see another um, friend or neighbor or human being suffering in the way a particular individual is. So I think it can be driven by an actual spiritual reality that someone has come become aware of or that other force within themselves that drives them to seek the good. That'd be another way I would say it, I think. I'm mindful, too, of the building we're in today. So this is going to be a slight, we're going to turn a little bit left here. Uh, we're, we're speaking tonight on the Playa Vista campus. And as I look out the window here, uh, I can see the other wing uh, with our colleagues from Facebook. And it doesn't look like anyone's working late tonight, uh, so I'm free to ask this question, although we will be posting this on their platform later in the week. Kai, in what ways has social media changed your industry? Inquiring minds want to know. I mean, how much time you got? I mean, it's <laughs> in every way, the way that news is written, the way it's disseminated, the way it's consumed. Uh, you know, when I talk to students, especially in our introduction class, uh, mostly freshmen, but you know, others as well, of course, um, one of the first things I ask them is, where do you go for news? And the most common answer is social media. And I'll often ask the answer, that's great, uh, but, but where on social media? Who are you getting your news from? And that's a much more difficult question for many students. Uh, because they don't discern, uh, say, the New York Times uh, Instagram feed from another Instagram feed. It's kind of uh, all, all news in a lot of ways. And I absolutely get it. Uh, young people today have never, they've been marketed to 24-7 their entire lives. And so marketing is just part of life, right? Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it's, with a lot of students, it's a matter of kind of, undoing some things that they've learned 
uh, about information before then uh, we're able to talk about what news is versus someone's Instagram account. You know, uh, what a reliable source of news is versus an unreliable source. Most things are unreliable sources of news. Um, you know, even that, it's, it's, social media has made it difficult to even define the news. I mean, just in every way. This idea of discernment, though, too, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, you know, since we talk a lot about this in, in our own tradition here, um, and this is in many spiritual traditions and, and ways of life, there is this idea of discernment, but it really is, uh, you, you know, uh, heavily articulated in the Ignatian traditions. What, 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 are the, what are the spiritual traditions here have to say about discernment? Well, it's very interesting that you're using this um, notion about how do you discern. I mean, how are these students going to distinguish from these platforms what is what? And, you know, in discernment, there's all these factors that you have to consider. You have to consider what kind of people do you want or what kind of information around do I need around my imaginary table? You know, so... What do I have to draw? What do I need to draw from? What kinds of information do I need if I'm going to make a, a decision about something like where I even get my news from or where I find the truth in, in what, what I'm uh, looking for? And so that means I'm, I'm going to draw on things that are reliable. I'm going to draw on um, some sources that are po uh, possibly um, my teachers, I'm going to look at uh, information that has uh, some annotation about it that seems to be resourced well. I'm going to have around the table also opinions that are diverse and that um, seem to mirror um, the information that I'm looking for and it's being reflected by the people who actually would be knowing something about the, inf the experience. So I think discernment always asks us to ask questions and to look at a variety of places that I find my information for truth. I don't, I never rely on just one source. And then together, it helps us formulate what we're really looking at. So discernment really, and, and we look within ourselves then. You also um, take a look at that in light of your own personal experiences. What has been true for you? Uh, what seems logical to you. So I think it, it calls on all those different ways of researching, of gathering information, of if it's information that concerns a certain group of people or people with a certain uh, kind of background or expertise, but I'm actually going to those people for the information that could help me discern the truth of a matter. So I think uh, the, that reality about the process of discernment would be helpful. Kai, if you had a magic wand along these lines, if, I don't. I will, if you do, pull it out because I would need you to cast a few spells, would be great. Um, let's say you have it uh, and you're able to cast a spell on all the readers in the, in the United States, all the people that consume media, how would you wish them to discern uh, what they're taking in today in light of how things have changed, especially with social media? If you could make everybody, pretend everybody was your undergrad student, if you could make them discern the news the way you think as a journalist, what, sh what should they be doing? Uh, we know they're not going to do it, but yeah. Uh, well, one thing would be everyone, I think every high school should teach, uh, you know, I, I took civics, but I think that's not taught as much. I think every high school should teach a media literacy course at the very least that maybe incorporates some civics. Uh, I talk to students who often, they desire it, but they haven't been given what, as much as they wanted in high school. Um, I think that would do a lot to uh, solve certain problems that we're having. Um, in more practical terms, I suppose, you know, one thing I would tell people is if a Somewhere where you're getting your news, if they, if their main job or their only job 
is not to report the news, maybe move on, uh, maybe don't get your news from there. I mean, that, even that, it's not a hard and fast rule, but, um, and that really, that, that falls into the literacy uh, category. I just really, I really think we need that to be taught to young people a lot more. What do you think the state of media literacy is right now, uh, particularly in our country? Really bad. Um, people are believing people and places and outlets that they should not believe. Uh, and I get it. I, I understand why people feel that way. We talked earlier about uh, news de deserts and the need to know what's going on around you. And when you don't, you'll latch on to anything that feels like it is finally giving you the truth and the information you need. Um, yeah, it, I mean, you know, we can't even, as a country, we've always had uh, trouble, perhaps, agreeing on the truth, right? Um, but that's okay, you know, we debate our truths and maybe we come to some sort of ultimate solution, right? Uh, Benjamin Franklin was the first uh, in a, uh, his apology for for printers, which was published in 1731, he made this argument that uh, newspapers should be this public forum uh, where people can present their ideas and the truth will out through that debate, right? Um, that's definitely not the case with uh, media uh, at this point. Um, but we can't even agree on facts at this point. Um, so we're nowhere um, in, in a lot of ways. and. Again, I, if I knew how to fix that, I'd be famous and rich. <laughs> Sister, what does it say for us as people? The deep desire to see truth, even if it's a falsehood. I think we want something that we can stand on, that we know will uphold us. And take us over the long haul. I don't think we like the idea of, you know, um, walking a tightrope. So I think, without a net, so I think that, that our deep desire to, um, to find the truth in, in whatever form we, we search it out is, is I think for that reason. I, and I think we want something that, um, will support us, and I think we want something that will help us make sense of our own experiences and our own life, and our relationships with others in that life. So I think, that, I think that's part of the desire. The problem, I think, sometimes enters into the fact that we have conjured what is best for us in that discovery. and it may not be the kind of reality or truth or, or product that really can offer truth. It, it, it's, it's, um, it doesn't have the, the, the power or the strength to do that because it's something that we're, kind of, we're, we're not willing to search for and debate, but we want to sort of make it our own little reality. And then what happens to us, it falls apart when we realize that it's not substantial. So I, I think that's where the, the issue comes in. Uh, and then we get disillusioned, and then we go to these extremes about there is no truth or there is no reality. reality. It's all about relevancy to what I need or my little community needs. However, I think that the desire, though, comes from this, this place of wanting that. I wouldn't want to call it just security, but a firm a kind of firm foundation on which we can continue to grow and build, and we know that there is something that will sustain us. This film we're about to watch can certainly give you a, um, can certainly put you in an impression. The sense that the world is simply coming unraveled. Um, you know, I think of not just journalists, but a uh, number of individuals, number of professions that labored through the pandemic especially, and have been received with vitriol and hate, the medical community, the academic, you know, uh, 
uh, educational community, the civic service community. Too, it's important to understand that instead of sitting into that depression, one of the things that perhaps might sustain everybody in all these professions is this sense of hope, as, as the traditions we're kind of talking about here always point to. So perhaps we can close with this uh, question, and I'll start with you, Kai. What do you see as, an, what do you see as a point of hope uh, for journalism, or perhaps our, our, our illiterate media community. Is there something to hope for as we emerge in, from the pandemic of the next few years? I think there's certainly something to hope for is simply a better world where some of these problems are solved. But I think, um, you know, it's journalists can be nihilists um, and uh, skeptics. And I, again, I go back, uh, I don't think about hope getting us out of it as much as I go back to thinking about rage getting us out of it uh, and, drive, and driving people. And maybe those are kind of two sides of the same coin or two ways to say similar things. Um, but I want people angry uh, and motivated to work hard to make things uh, but people are motivated by different things, of course. Not everyone is motivated by rage. I might be showing a little bit of myself here, but, but um, yeah, I always I like to see people angry at injustice, uh, and we we see. I feel like we're seeing that maybe more in the last several years than we have before. And there was certainly injustice before, um, and I my hope is that that rage is not. Uh, just, you know, screaming into the wind that there will be, and I think there already has been, like, real change uh, because of it. Sister? I think that the younger generation, that seriously, it gives me a lot of cause for hope because when I look at some of the um, movements and, and that have happened of late, there are a lot of very young people, I mean, even in their early teens, who seem to be very versed in what's going on, and that change has to happen. I think about that with climate change, uh, issues of violence, how are we coming to come together uh, in diversity, uh, and so forth. And I think there's a number of young people, um, including in our own university here and so forth, who at an earlier age have a keener awareness of some of the critical issues that we have to be fighting for. And I think that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, and uh, in spite of the fact that some of their elders have made some pretty big mistakes along the way. And I think that gives me a lot of energy. And it wants me to continue what I do uh, because I want to be in support of that new generation. Because we have to rely on that. And we have to, I feel, I need to um, believe that that this will carry us through and continue to carry us through. Kai, Marianne, thank you both very much for this conversation this evening. For those of you joining us online, we will be taking your questions next week. So leave your questions in the comments section and we will tackle those uh, in a, uh, another round um, online uh, in a few days. For those of you in the theater with us tonight, thank you and here is the film uh, endangered. Enjoy.